Hey, we are so glad to be here with you today. We're going to have a blessed day together in the house of the Lord, known as Majestic View Church. And I just want to encourage you for making the effort uh, to be here as we join together to know God and make him known. We have a fantastic service lined up today, and there are just a few announcements uh, before we get started. And uh, we are uh, initiating a shut-in ministry. That's a very important ministry during these times, especially. And uh, I think uh, Russell has a photo just because we like to lead by example. And uh, here you go. There's a uh, shut-in and a soon-to-be shut-in, right? So, uh, yeah, and there's actually three of us in the photo, you may notice. Uh, we have uh, Miss Sharon Houndshell and uh, myself, and then her uh, orange cranberry loaf kind of takes up a big part of the screen. Yeah, so I don't know, uh, are there any orange cranberry loaf bakers out there? Uh, hers is the best so far, but luckily for you, it's the only one I've had, so... I'm an impartial judge. You could ask anyone and just bring your loaf in and we'll size it up for you and let you know how, how it goes. All right. So uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, Mrs. Houndshell is actually in a really challenging place because she is, as far as I know, the only widowed amputee grandmother, uh, I think, in Elbert County. And she's our dear, precious sister in the Lord. And as this shut-in uh, ministry gets rolling, some folks have more technology than others. Uh, I do want to just uh, welcome our live stream guests, and I want to thank Pastor Paul and the sound team for getting our live stream uh, back on track. Thank you guys for that. Let's give them a hand. Hey. Yeah, so uh, that's going to help a lot with the shut-in ministry, but there's a lot more that can be done. And eating... Uh, Orange cranberry loaf is just part of it, right? But uh, it's a pretty darn good ministry. But, guys, we got uh, the Lord with us, and there's a lot where he's at work in a lot of places, and there's a lot of opportunities for you to join. Uh, we have at the bottom our current ministry opportunities. I would just encourage you to consider where you're at. For our young, our married couples that have children, we consider that you're in the stress bubble of life. Um, and your ministry is probably right at your house, and we really want to minister to you. We really want to minister to everyone. But if you are someone that has some time, uh, consider some of these ministry opportunities and uh, let God use you. You'll be glad you did. All right, we have our ladies' coffee and tea time coming up, and that's going to be hosted in the brand-new Elevation Community Center. Amen? Yeah, who wants to be a fly on the wall for that? I, uh, I would love to be there. Uh, ladies, you're going to want to check that out. We have some child care available. There's a phone number to call. Our next uh, men's event is going to be on the 30th, this, the 30th of the month. That's going to be in Elizabeth at the American Legion Hall. Uh, that's a little ways out, so look for some more information on that. Uh, we're soaping together. We got our brand new soap insert, this yellow guy. So we're reading the scripture together. Um, as a body, and it's very powerful. I've been doing this for a long time, and I can't say I got 100% perfect attendance, but when you're reading the word where you are, along with all your brothers and sisters where they are, there is a connection there uh, that you don't want to miss out on. So I would just encourage you there. All right, there's a lot more to talk about. It's in your bulletin. Great things are happening. Uh, there is a brand new Awana prayer sheet, and that's at the bank, uh, back of the sanctuary. And of all the ministries at the church, uh, the Iwana ministry is very uh, alive. Is that a good word? Yeah, a lot of children, and the word is going out powerfully. So grab that prayer sheet, and I believe now we're going to worship the Lord together. Just wanted to open us up with uh, just a reminder of who our God is. Uh, our goal and desire is for us to know God. And we want to continue to know him through his word. Uh, what, 
we shared as leaders this weekend was a beautiful passage in Isaiah chapter 6. Just a small phrase here where the angels are constantly, eternally calling out this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And that's, that's our prayer. That's what we desire. That's why we sing together, is to radiate His praises, His glory to a world that is watching. So if you would stand with me as we sing. We want His kingdom to come. We want His kingdom to be here in this church and out in Kiowa. Let's pray for that and let's be His witness and pray for His kingdom to come. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we Let's pray together. Father, it is a good day to be in your house. We thank you for that privilege. Lord, I pray this morning that what is done here would honor your holy name. Lord, we've made it a priority to start our service by talking to you. Because we know if you don't come, if you don't speak to us, if you don't direct the proceedings. Lord, we're wasting our time. So I pray right now that everyone here could unpack their bags, including me. The stuff that we brought from this week, the stuff that even from this morning, before we got here. Lord, I just want to lay it on the table. Maybe throw it out in the all in the uh, foyer. 
And Father, let you speak what you want to speak today. Lord, we need the hope of Jesus in our hearts in a world that's gone crazy. So Lord, we focus upon, upon you and your work that you're trying to do, that you are doing, that we're trying to join you in, in this community. Lord, would you bless us today? Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to recognize our elder, Jim Keen, and uh, he's got some very special things to share with you. There, I think that's a little better. <laughs> uh, this is a very special morning because we're going to ordain two new deacons. You know, the Greek word in the Bible for deacon can also be translated as servant. And that's what the deacons are in our fellowship. They're here to serve you. And there's many of you who are new here in the last year or so. Some of you have moved. It's really important that we get your contact information, because deacons are going to be divided up. The congregation will be divided up, and each deacon will have a certain number of you that there will be your primary contact with the church. So if we don't have your email and your contact information, take that little thing in a bulletin and drop it in the um, offering basket so the office can have your name available, because in the next uh, several weeks and months, um, we will be dividing up the church, and each person will have a deacon, which will be your primary contact. So if um, Moose and Cecil, if you would come on up. All right. What a joy it is to add these two brothers to our list of servants in our church that are here to serve you, to serve us. The primary role of a deacon in Scripture was to uh, the, the original deacons were brought about because they had a great growth of people. And the pastors found themselves, instead of ministering the word and prayer, they found themselves proverbially serving tables. And there is a very great need to serve tables, especially in the area where we have people that are shut in or in a situation in their life where they uh, are in great need. And so the Lord gave the church deacons, servants that were men that were filled with the Spirit of God that had a great love for people, a great love for the Word of God, and a great love for the work of God. And so today, uh, we get to add two more to our ministry of servants. Uh, it's, it's a constant challenge to stay up with people, to keep in connection with people, and you know, these guys and the other deacons in our midst, they need your help. Some people say, I don't even know who my deacon is. Well, you know, uh, if something has happened and there's been a miscommunication, we need to know that because I can tell you it is our heart that we are serving you and that as a body, we're, we're connecting with each other and protecting each other and supporting each other in the difficulties of life. I appreciate so much uh, Jim Keene, who uh, started out as a deacon, and then now he is an elder in our church. And uh, Jim is, is uh, trying to lead this ministry for us. And so would you just help me say thank you to Jim and uh, all that he's doing there. Amen. Uh, for those of you that don't know, you'll hear a little bit more about this as we go on through the day. But uh, uh, 
we had a staff retreat. It's only the second one in the history of the church. By staff, I'm talking about its elders and our our leadership met with our wives uh, for a couple of days this week. It was an outstanding time. And I can't tell you what it means to me to have the wisdom and the love of the Lord Jesus and love of people that I have as this my brother as he represents that with us. So with that being said, we're going to begin our process this morning and uh, let you get to know a little bit more about these two brothers and let you hear a little bit about their hearts. And we're not going to, this is not going to be a lengthy event, uh, well, unless they start preaching or something, but anyway. Uh, Cecil assured me that wasn't going to happen, but uh, on his part, I don't know about Moose, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, what I want you to do is to hear their story of how they came to Jesus, and um, that's where we're going to start. So Cecil, you want to be, begin with, you can stand if you would like to, brother. Would you rather sit? I don't care. You'd rather sit? Okay. Well, let me move this so everybody can see you. Okay, I'm going to go to this, and you can have that. All right, make sure you hold it up here. Cecil, begin by telling us uh, your story of how you came to know Jesus Christ. I went forward at uh, the age of eight to give my life to the Lord. Uh, we were, I lived in Pennsylvania and uh, was going to a very evangelistic uh, church. Uh, it was in a revival meeting in the fall. And uh, that was uh, about 76 and a half years ago that uh, I gave my life to the Lord. So, um, and then when I turned 18, I rededicated myself to the Lord and what he would have me to do. And so uh, I've been trying to walk with the Lord since, and he has been with me every step of the way. Uh, sometimes I wasn't always in step with him, but uh, he brought me back to the way that I should be. And today I can say with unequivocally that uh, the Lord is my Savior. I'm on my way to heaven, and uh, I'm walking in the way the Lord wants me to walk. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. We're going to go back and forth, Okay. Because I've got another question I'm going to ask Cecil and you. But first, Moose, uh, you respond to that also. Well, uh, I have always been walking with the Lord, and I sure didn't start off at a young age. And uh, so I'm totally opposite of Cecil. And But I'm not completely worthless. I've always been good for a bad example most of the time. So, But um, uh, I was not raised in a... Christian home, and it was kind of funny. You know, my, my parents were attenders of a church, but they weren't followers. And when you're when I was born, our pastor had uh, come to the house looking for him, and to make a long story short, uh, that was that was not a good meeting. And and you when the the sin of man, you know, we don't fall far from the tree, right? So there's a lot of things in my life that I was told all my life about. It's all about the money and all this. And when I came to Majestic View Church, which I didn't want to, but my wife made me. <laughs> and, and Tom Mowry. Tom Mowry was one of those encouraging people that uh, it was a big part of that is coming to this church because she got he got Christy here. I think that was part of the tactical deception plan. But um, But anyhow... When we came to this church, we had um, all the things that we had told our whole lives about the lies of the body of Christ were not true, or they they didn't appear here. And we're done with, so we came another Sunday, and another Sunday, and we've been coming since about 2007, I think. So... This is uh, about time I got off my duff and started serving you, for so many of you have served me and my family. So, um, But anyhow, it's, you know, it's one of those things, it's a process. I can't tell you the day I was saved. Uh, it was a lot of work the Lord had to do through many people here. <clears throat> and, um, but uh, it's, finally, it's good to finally get here, you know, so... The uh, 
I can't, I'm having a brain fart right That's now. Okay. <laughs> but it'll come back to me. But anyhow, we through 2007 to now, it was uh, quite a process. And, you know, everyone wants to have a date. So New Year's Day fell on a Sunday one year, and it was right in about the time that I had gotten uh, up the gumption to say I, I'm going to make the statement here. So January 1st of 2012, I was baptized right there with uh, Pastor John, and Pastor Brian was the one who got wet, so PBJ. And I was afraid that he might drop me. So we got the big guy, <laughs> which is not true. He's pretty stout himself. But but anyhow, from 2012, you know, it's kind of funny how the Lord works on you. We uh, we started homeschooling. I mean, we had, I mean, that year of 2012 was an incredible year. And um, Pastor John had made us a life group leader. And uh, a life group leader is very similar to what I see the deacon being because we had people that we are responsible for. So this is not totally new to us. But uh, uh, I, had, I was uh, in a position where I was, had people in our life group that I think were leading me to the Lord. Uh, Pastor John had some tears shed over with me over, man, I'm not ready for this. And he goes, you hang in there. You'll learn more than you think you can. And it was a, a wonderful year. And then we were blessed with our third child. So it was just, we had all, 2012 was an incredible, incredible year. But what's funny is, is as you, it seems like yesterday, when you're, when you're a believer, it's always new. You're always amazed at the miracles you see. And uh, yeah, it's been eight, nine years. It's time, time to serve again amen and and you know um you, praise the lord you um he actually answered my second question but anyway uh, uh which is fine you know moose as and i want to just state this from my heart you know i was so excited today that you you told the world jesus christ is your savior and that was quite a deal for him and uh uh, praise the Lord for that. And I'm so thankful that your stories are not the same because I guarantee you there's a lot of different stories out here too. And it helps us understand people. But uh, the thing that has always stuck out to me about Moose is the fact that he is about the fellowship of this church and the unity of this church. And uh, he has come to me and pestered me, I mean, encouraged me uh, <laughs> and and I'm joking. Uh, he has been a constant reminder to me of the need for this body to be together. And not just be together in heart, but to be together physically whenever possible. And so I thank you, my brother, and I welcome you to this team. Amen. Cecil, tell us uh, a little bit about your love for this church. Well, uh, wife and I had, uh, we moved down to Kiowa from Aurora, and we were going to church up there, to, uh, and uh, we had been driving back and forth, but 40 miles gets to be a bit long on Sunday mornings, particularly when the weather gets bad. So we uh, had passed by Majestic View, and uh, uh, we stopped out front, uh, Pastor, and a group of young people people from Kansas or uh, Nebraska or somewhere were working, and uh, so we stopped and inquired about the church and made some, uh, or asked some questions about it, and uh, after we decided that traveling the 40 miles up and back to Aurora, we decided that we would give it a go here at Majestic View, and we were welcomed. Uh, we have a good church family here, a family that I uh, have stood behind us and with us in all the things. And uh, we listened to Pastor John preach and decided that he was preaching the truth, and that was what we were looking for. And uh, so we decided that we would start coming to church here. And that was 19 and a half years ago. And uh, uh, it, each and every one has been a blessing. 
to us. Although we, you know, I, I see people's faces and I, I recognize them facially, but I can't remember names. Uh, so uh, that's one of those things that uh, wife was, wife wanted to be a servant. That was her uh, portion in life that she loved to do. And of course, uh, she volunteered me for a lot of things. And uh, so that uh, is how I uh, got into serving people too. And that's, that is uh, my wish in life to be a servant for the Lord to other individuals. Cecil and Miss Phyllis were married for 61 years. And um, Miss Phyllis today is with the Lord, but she's in those grandstands that Hebrews 12 talks about. And we know she's cheering Cecil on. And uh, I asked him for permission to share that. But I don't think it would be appropriate for us to talk about Cecil today and and what he is doing and stepping out if we didn't mention Miss Phyllis. Amen. Uh, because those of us that have known him a long time uh, know how special they were as a couple and how special she is and was. Uh, because I guarantee you she's still alive in our hearts. And she's more than alive in, in heaven with the Lord. So praise God for that. But brothers, I want to ask you a question and I've got something to present to you. Moose, do you believe the word of God to be true? And that salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you support the doctrine and the teachings of this church? Amen. Cecil, the same question to you. Amen. Well, brothers, uh, with that being said, let me hand this to you, brother. It is our custom when we ordain someone that we give them an ordination Bible. Uh, I still have my ordination Bible, and it is a precious, precious reminder to me that it is about the Word of God and a standing on the Word of God. And even though the primary role of a deacon is often physical acts of service, the foundation of every deacon must be the Word of God. And so, my brothers, as I hand you these Bibles, they're unique. Uh, talk to Cecil, and you can imagine after all these years of walking with the Lord, I said, how many Bibles do you have? He said, six. <laughs> and I said, well, let me, let me give you a tool that uh, you don't have, and we discussed that. And so, we're giving him a very special Bible that is a study Bible, uh, unlike anything that he has. And Cecil, it's with all of my heart that I give you this book and I encourage you to use it as you have for so many years and may it be a blessing to you. It's my prayer. Amen. God bless you, brother. Moose, you're my brother, you're my friend, and it's my joy to be your pastor. And for you to now be on the deacon team, God bless you, bro. And with all of my heart, I give you this book and tell you, let it be a, a light under your path, a lamp for your feet. Right, it's God's word in your heart every day. God bless you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say a word? Absolutely. It's kind of funny if you look at the uh, how God works. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do this, and my life wasn't right. I wasn't in the word every day. And, and not that I'm in the Word every day now, but it's, there's a habit that, it, that has occurred. And uh, so this is good timing. And it's about serving others. And after this service, we have a ministry meeting. And I just find a very, you know, that's the Holy Spirit when all that stuff comes together with these types of things. And, and uh, when you're in the right spot, you can see that type of stuff. And it's a, just so encouraging. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we want to... Uh... Commit you to the Lord. Go ahead and stay, stay seated. If you're a current deacon or an elder of the church, if you come on up and let's lay on hands and um, and pray for these two folks.
Lord Jesus, we bless you, we praise you and honor you with our lives. We pray for Cecil and Moose that they will be shining lights in our congregation and to your honor and glory. We commit them to your service and we ask your favor upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, brothers. Let's give them one more special word of encouragement. We can do that with clapping, can't we? This day is about service. We're going to be talking about harvest time in just a few minutes from the Word of God. And uh, so as we study this, I mean, we're talking about deacons, we're talking about finding our place of service, wherever that is. Uh, it's time for us to worship. Come on, worship team, and uh, let's worship the Lord. Today is going to be about the harvest being plentiful, and God is calling us as laborers to go into that field. So I thought this song, For the Cause of Christ our King, we go and we're sent. We might be sent across the world. We might be sent right here in Kiowa or Elbert or Elizabeth or wherever you might be coming from. We are missionaries no matter what into the world and here locally. So may we do this for the cause of Christ. It is all about him. Let's sing this together. Be our life's refrain. Let it be 
my life's refrain. To live is Christ, to die is Cain. Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Sing that again. Let it be my life's refrain. To live is Christ, to die is Cain. Deny myself, take up my cross and Follow the sun. Christ, we proclaim the name above every name. For all creation, every nation, God's salvation to the sun. Christ, we proclaim. Christ, we proclaim the name above every Let's bring our hearts, our doubts, our worries to our Father who cares. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before your God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship, come, now is the time to As you are to worship, bring everything that you are. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, come.
his praise resounds beyond the stars and echoes in our hearts the greatest one of all his face shines brighter than the sun His grace as boundless as His love. He reigns with healing in His wings, the King above all kings, the greatest one of all. Christ our God, oh, seated on high, the undefeated one, mountains bow down as we lift him up, there is no other name, there is no other name, Jesus Christ our God, oh.
Is he yours today? What a wonderful time to worship together. You may be seated. Kind of dark out here. I wanted you guys to go back with me. This morning we're going to visit the pea patch together. Now, it needed to be dark when I came in because that's the way it was. When you went to the pea patch in North Louisiana in 1968, 69, 70, 71, 72. Now, all those years of growing up on a farm in North Louisiana. The reason you went before daylight was because when that sun came up, it wouldn't take long until the sweat was dripping off the end of your nose. Now, when you first got out there, um, there was lots of this thing we call dew. You don't know too much about it out here. But uh, even when it was in drought conditions, there was still dew on the plants before daylight, it seemed like. And it didn't take long until your feet, which you made sure you washed the night before before you went to bed, they were muddy because of the dew off the plants and the dirt in the field. Well, when you got out there in the field, I'll I'll be real honest with you, I I wish I could go back and do it again one time. Uh, I didn't particularly look forward to pea picking day, because it wasn't just one day. And uh, this auditorium was about half the size of our pea patch. At least that's the way it seemed to a 10-year-old boy. And I was picking peas before I was 10. And I was picking peas after I was 10. (laughs) But we'll just pick that number out of the hat, okay? I think the field probably was about twice as big as this room. And it was an important field. Now, we tried a few other kinds of peas, but the number one variety that we enjoyed, which was the staple of the South, was purple hull peas. And it was, they, we liked them. They were really good to eat. Wish I had some for lunch today. Been a long time. But uh, they were also easy to pick because when they were ripe, they were a beautiful purple color. When they were green, they were green. And so it's pretty easy to know the difference. I always did hate to pick butter beans so much harder because you had to grab a hold of the bean and fill of it and see if it was fat enough. And if you picked a bean with my mom that wasn't fat enough, you just wasted it. My idea was pick it all and then you don't have to come back. (laughs) But mom wasn't too happy about that when the, the second picking wasn't what it should be because you picked too many green ones or not ripe ones. Anyway, we're in the pea patch today, and we don't want to bring up those ugly memories of butter beans. But a huge field with rows between, uh, oh, probably about that wide, and the peas would get so big that they would spread over. So as you were walking down the dead center of the row, your legs were getting wet and you're brushing leaves on both sides. Louisiana is a place of great uh, abundance and harvest. Lots of uh, productivity. The soil is good. The water is good. Plenty of sunshine. And so we had good crops. And it was a good thing. Because we lived on a country church's pastor's salary. And that wasn't very much money. So those peas were important. Now, I didn't really think about it all that way when I was a little boy because 
I was thinking about the next two, three hours that I was going to spend in the pea patch, which seemed like five or six or seven or eight hours. But anyway, we'd get to work. And as we got to work, you know, you start trying to fill up your bucket. Well, all kinds of things happen. I don't have my bucket with me this morning, but we had five-gallon buckets. Yes, they did make those back then, okay? And they were made of plastic, okay? Uh, but, you know, you either had one, two choices. You could stand there bent over the whole time, which that got pretty old. You could get out on your hands and knees, or you could sit on your bucket. Now, I would sit on the bucket every chance I got because that would give me an opportunity to look around and throw vines that broke off at my sister. And, uh, you know, just be an aggravation and uh, those kinds of things. Of course, at the end of the row, your mom was going to be wondering uh, if your bucket was full or not. And Really, your bucket should have been full way before you got to the end of the row. Now, when we pick peas, you think, are you exaggerating this? I remember days that we'd pick five, six bushels of peas. My sister and I and mom and dad, if he felt sorry enough for us, okay? Uh, and we're talking a bushel basket, which was about that big around and about that deep. And it wasn't like you just stuck it in there. You you stuck it in there and you shook it down and you pressed on it a little bit so that it was full. That's a lot of peas. That's a lot of picking. That's a lot of sweating. But you know, I look back on that and I think just how important it was that we valued that harvest time and that gift of God. Well, the daylight would come, and uh, as daylight would come, there we'd be picking our peas. This morning, I want to preach to you out of the Word of God from Luke chapter 10. Would you stand with me as we read from that passage? Now, this one's been simmering for a couple of weeks, folks, because uh, this was my outline for last week, and we just didn't get to it. God had other plans. Today, I'm excited about what God has for us as we talk about building bridges in 2021, harvest time. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where He Himself was about to go. Then He said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. And whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as they are set before you. And heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out of its streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and to judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Father, we need your inspiration today. We need your truth. We need to hear your call. And Lord, as I pray for this time, I pray, God, that you would stir people to the calling that you have for their lives. Your very best plan for them, Lord, 
whatever that may be. God, I pray that all of us would be like the prophet Isaiah when he saw you. He said, here am I, send me. So Lord, would you touch us today? Would you grab a hold of our hearts? And would you, Lord, bring us to a place of humility and surrender that says, here we go. Here am I. I love you, Lord. I pray you bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. First of all today, I want to talk about the call to go in harvest time. The call to go is, the, the harvest field is a place of abundance. Someone said something to me this morning about the exciting times that we're living in. I know other people might not describe it that way, but it's definitely exciting. And there's definitely a lot going on in our, our country, in our culture today. But here's something that I, is absolutely true. The harvest field is a place of abundance. Uh, you can't see this physically, but I can see it in my mind's eye. That big field that was out there, and it was just purple with purple hole peas. It all needed to be picked. It all needed to be brought in. And, and today, the, the harvest field is great. In Elbert County, I don't know the exact numbers, but less than 15% of people attend church and hear the Word of God on a regular basis. Less than 15%. Now listen, that doesn't mean that, that all the rest of those 85% are, are lost without Christ, but it means that they're not regularly hearing the Word of God, which tells me from, my, from the Word of God that they're not growing. They're not, they're not being challenged by their brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a bad place to be as a believer, and it's a place of disobedience, quite honestly. That's what the Word says. So the place that we live in is a great harvest field that there is a lot of apathy toward God's work. And yet today, there is a hunger that has arisen amongst people that is unprecedented in the 20 plus years that I have lived in this county. People are asking questions that they've not asked maybe in their lifetime and for sure in a long time. And they're looking for answers and they're looking for hope. The harvest field is a place of abundance. It's a place of abundant opportunity. The Lord Jesus himself said to them, the harvest truly is great. Now, this isn't just preacher, some preacher talking with poetic license here. Jesus said, the harvest field is great. Would you say that with me? The harvest field is great. There's a lot of need around us today. There's a lot of need in this crowd here today. There's a place of abundant opportunity. It's a place of abundant need. Does anybody know anyone that's in trouble today? In a county that's had 10 COVID deaths as of when I checked last week, I haven't looked in the last couple of days, we have had in that same time period 12 suicides and over 25 attempted suicides. There's a need. There's a great need in our county today. And it's a place of abundant support. Jesus described these, these fields, and he said, The laborers are few, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I'll never forget when I was in the pea patch, often, you know, mom had other stuff that she was doing, and mom's work was just beginning when those peas got picked. In fact, our work was just beginning. So oftentimes it was me and my sister out there, of course, until she graduated high school, and then you know who it was. She was five years older than me. But anyway, uh, when we went out to the pick, it was often just me and my sister. And you know, my sister and I are very close today, and she is a dear woman of God, but we fought like cats and dogs. She was five years older than me, and may I say it, she was pretty doggone bossy, especially to a little brother that was seeing how every way he could get out of work. Y'all never know anybody like that, do you? So we were out there in the field, and, and we, you know what? It doesn't matter 
I, my parents, when they said to go do it, you went and did it, and you stayed at it until you finished it, okay? So whatever we had to pick, we had to pick. Oh, my goodness. When you'd look up and you'd see that mom had had mercy on us. Now, mom could outpick both of us two to one, okay? And everything just all of a sudden picked up when mom showed up because, you know, you're out there, and I don't know that I was praying to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers, but I sure was excited when the laborer came, especially when mom came. And then if dad, if we had a really big crop and dad would show up, now that was pretty amazing. Now dad had done a lot of work too in preparing and keeping that thing weeded and all that stuff. But for some reason when pea picking time came, dad usually had a bad back. And I don't blame him. His back was bad, but uh, anyway, it seemed like it was a little worse on pea picking day. And uh, and he, he always was busy working hard. He was a hard, hard working man. I don't want to make him look bad, but I just know, he, like me, he probably didn't like pea picking as much as, as some other things, you know? So, but when, the, when mom would come, oh, the joy, because we have got reinforcements. We got reinforcements. People are coming to help us harvest this field. In verse 3, Jesus said this, Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Now, the pea patch wasn't particularly a dangerous place unless it was somebody throwing a dirt clot at somebody else. But uh, So it doesn't really cross over in this respect. But as Jesus talked about the harvest field that he was sending his laborers to, he said, I want you to know it's a dangerous place. It's a place that they're that you are going out as lambs amongst the wolves. Hear me, folks. God has called me. God has called the leadership of this church. And I firmly believe God has called this church body to be the light of the world and to share the truth about Jesus Christ with our community. To support each other, to help each other, to grow each other together. But we got a mission, folks. And that mission is to follow the Lord, to know the Lord, and to make Him be known in our community. And as we go out, we are going into a world that every day is becoming more and more volatile, more and more angry. More and more we are becoming the lambs in the midst of wolves. And you say, oh my goodness, why would I go and put myself in such danger? I'll tell you why. Because I got a shepherd that can handle any wolf that comes my way. Amen? But we're going out there. Jesus said, I want you to know. I'm sending you, and this is what you're going to encounter. I encountered something very challenging even this morning before 5.30 through social media. It's out there. It's coming. It's around us. And those people that might be perceived as wolves, that, that might be a threat to us, often what they are is people that are hurting, people that are scared, people that are misinformed, people that don't understand, people that need love. And even when there are things that are said that are unkind or hurtful or even uh, threatening to us, God help us. To be like those lambs that are going out to share the love of Jesus Christ, even with the wolves. Finally, as we have the call to go, we know what we're doing. We know it's a place of abundance. We know the dangers that are involved. We need to learn to trust the Lord spiritually. Trust the Lord for everything. Look at verse 4. He says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Not very often that I preach barefooted. I don't like it. My feet get cold, okay? But I I stand here in bare feet to tell you, the Lord said, I want you to go. And he, he basically is saying, you go just like you are. And trust me to provide what you need. Wow. When I came to Colorado, I knew that the Lord had called us to this place. I absolutely knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The churches that I had pastored up until the time I came here didn't know what severance pay was. 
Deb and I had six kids, and we lived from paycheck to paycheck, barely. Okay? Took a month for our first paycheck to catch up with this as we got here. My father-in-law was at church one Sunday, and a man in church that was very had a lot of means, he walked up and he said, Harold, he said, what does John need? And he said, well, things are pretty tight for him financially. About two days later, we got a check for $5,000 in the mail. Now, in 1996, $5,000 is a lot of money today. It was a lot more money in 1996. And you know, we knew from the get-go that God would provide for us. He told us to go. And I'm telling you, as Jesus was sending out the 70, He was saying, you go, and I want you to go this time, and I don't want you to make any real preparation except for your heart to go and to do what I tell you to do. Why is that? Why is it that when we were doing our remodel, God didn't just give us $100,000 the first day? Why not? Why not? Why didn't God just go ahead and give us a million so we could have some extra, okay? Why didn't God do that? Because I want to tell you what, the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills wants us to trust Him. I heard it said this weekend that God does not provide for us any more than the next step that He's called us to take. And that is very true. You know why? Because He wants us to trust Him with every step. He wants us to trust Him with every breath. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I am terrifying some people when I say that to you. But I want you to know in your personal life, God is wanting you to learn to trust Him with every step. Well, for number one, it's exciting when you trust God that way. But here's the biggest thing. You get to know Him. You get to love Him. You get to understand Him. And you get to realize that He cares about you and what He wants you and how He wants to have that relationship and what He's called you to do. So there is the call to go. And the call to go is to trust the Lord. But it's not just spiritually. To trust the Lord in the discussion. Because really to trust the Lord spiritually is to trust God for everything. Absolutely. Secondly. There's the instructions for the work. In verse, in, in verse 5, it says, But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. Now, when we went out to the pea patch, remember I told you that they were so big that they would cover up the middle. Now, my dad really liked that because it meant less plowing. Harder for grass to grow when it's shaded out. But it also meant that you had to walk through there. And I got in trouble more than once for stomping on the vines, okay? Uh, for crushing the vines, or maybe from yanking too hard on the pea and picking part of the vine with it, okay? Because that happened occasionally. And, and I always was reminded, because listen, things were tight at my house, real tight, all of my growing up days. We didn't have much money. We had everything we needed and a lot that we wanted and we always had more food than we deserved, okay? Never hungry. But we didn't have much. We worked for it. And so when you messed up a pea vine, you were messing up a principle, okay? One pea vine out of that big field, what's the big deal? No, it is being careless with what God has given you. That was the fundamental truth. And as the Lord told them to go, He, he, he told them, He says, you be careful with my vines and fruit. Now listen to me. As I go out as a lamb amongst the wolves and I go out into a world that's, that's outside these walls, you know what I'm going to encounter? I'm going to encounter, encounter anger. I'm going to encounter people that hate Christians. I'm going to encounter people that, that have been told a lie about who I am. I'm going to encounter that often as I encounter the world. There is an attitude, and it's a growing attitude, in the United States of America that have made Christians the enemy. Amen? And some of you are experiencing that in the workplace, and some of you aren't. But it's out there. 
And so here's the deal. Some of the meanest people on this planet someday are going to be some of the greatest saints of God. Amen, Moose. Moose has told me stories about who he used to be. And praise God, by the grace of God, you aren't that man anymore. And there's some other folks in here that could tell me similar stories about who you used to be. And women too, for that matter. Aren't you glad that somebody was careful with the vine? Aren't you glad that somebody was careful with the fruit that God had out there? Aren't you glad that there was an Ananias that went to the Apostle Paul when he was known as Saul and risked his life? Because that's what Saul was doing, was killing Christians. Be careful with my vines and fruit. And so in verse 5, he says, you build bridges. When you go, you say, peace to this house. What is the mission of our church? Our, the mission of our church is to tell the truth about Jesus Christ and share His love. And it is to build bridges, relational bridges, to people that may not want a bridge built to them. To people that may not like us. Heaven forbid, to people that might not agree with us. To people who might have a different lifestyle than us. To people who might dress different from us. To people who might do things to their bodies different than we do. Amen. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. Sometimes it's plumb threatening. But that's what Jesus did for us, folks. Now, I'm in a different category than a lot of folks in this room. I have never known anything but a Christian family. And I would say well over half this church, if maybe not three quarters of this church, are people that came to the grace of God in spite of the way they were raised. Aren't you glad? Somebody was building bridges. Can I get an amen for that? And I want to say an amen to that based on the fact I'm glad I got to know you. But you came from a different world than I did. Thank God for bridge builders. Again, we run into verse 6 and 7. He says, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. I think there's a whole lot in that verse. But in that short time, he was telling them to build relationships. And he was telling them to trust God to provide through people that they were going to encounter. Pretty amazing. Trust the Lord physically. Trust the Lord spiritually. God will take care of your needs. And then in verse 8, he says, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they are set before you. i got to tell you a funny story. When uh, Some have heard this, have been around Majestic View a long time, but when I was a young preacher, my mom uh, and I finally got old enough that I could drive myself. When I first started going, my mom would drive me to preach, okay? Uh, and so after that, I got old enough to drive myself. And I remember one of the first times that happened, I was going to Spring Hill, Louisiana. And mom said, John, excuse me, she said, Johnny. She said, I want, I want you to understand, you're going to go eat at Deacon such and such's house today, and you've got to eat whatever is on the plate in front of you. Yes, ma'am. I took it serious because how it was ingrained in me that you, you lose your message. You lose, if you don't earn the right and you don't care about people, you lose your uh, authority to talk to them. So a man went and preached that morning. I was going to stay for the afternoon, preach that night. Pastor was on vacation or something. And so we get to the house and I'm sitting there. And of course, the guy turns the football game on, black and white TV, of course, but football game on. And uh, he's sitting there and we're talking. He said, oh, we have got a meal today. So excited. And I'm thinking the staple of the South is fried chicken. Yes, yes. You know, here it comes. And he says, today we're going to, my wife is fixing up a bait of fried okra. To that point in my life, 
That's about the worst thing you could have said to me. The only thing worse you could have said was boiled turnip greens. Thank God he spoiled, he spared me from that. But so I'm sitting there going, "Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. <laughs> we can do this." Do you know what? I love fried okra today. Absolutely like I hadn't had any in a long time. And listen, they don't make fried okra like my mama did. Ooh boy. It's different out here. When you order it in a restaurant out here, it's got that big old wad of, of uh batter on the outside of it. No, no, that's not the way you did it. My mom just kind of rolled it in uh eggs and cornmeal and threw it in the uh the skillet and gr- and cooked it up. Oh, that's good. I wish I could have that again. I really do. <laughs> Miss Deborah says no. Don't go it. <laughs> oh, eat whatever is set before you. The Lord said, "You allow those people to bless you, and whatever it is, you consider it a blessing." And then He said, "And while you're there, you heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you." Now. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but I want you to know something. We need to be bold to encounter the living God and intercede on behalf of people in our community that don't know Him that have crisis in their lives. And we need to be bold to ask the living God to do things for them that is supernatural. That's what He was doing. God does not always heal everybody. God does not always deliver you from the financial crisis, especially if you're the one that dug the hole that got you there. But I want you to know God cares about people. And as God's representatives go out, they need to be engaged in the lives of people and engaged in the pain of people and in loving folks and loving their neighbors every way we can find a way to do that. And that does include praying with them and asking God for big things. So, he he said, serve them. In verse 10, he says, uh, in whatever city you enter, and if they do not receive, you go out and into its streets and say, wipe the dust off your feet. They're not going to receive you. He said, go on. Now, I don't think that God would have us to be mean and belligerent with people. But I do think this principle underlies this. And that is this, there are places that the fruit is ripe to pick. And we need to make sure that we're spending our time with people that are ready to listen. You think about it. Have there been times in your life that you, somebody could have told you something and you'd have gone, Shoop, I don't care what you've got to say. I'm not listening. My mind is made up. And you know what? If that's the case with your coworker, just love them. You start trying to preach to them every day, you know what's going to happen? The door is going to get tighter and tighter closed. And Jesus is saying here, you, you go and you go to those places where my spirit is moving. Now let me tell you something, folks. The spirit of God is moving in this community like I've not seen it in my 24 years of living here. There is an openness and a hunger amongst people like never before. It's time for us to tell the people about Jesus and to love them as we go along. Not everyone is, but many are. And so the Lord said, you go and you look for places where the fruit is ready to pick. And then in verse 11 and 12, he says, The very dust of your city which things to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you But I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Now, I I said God wouldn't have us to be belligerent and mean, but that doesn't mean that there's not an appropriate time to tell the truth. And the truth doesn't always feel good, does it? The fact of the matter is, our country is in the dilemma it's in today because our country has been built in the last few years or last many years on selfishness, on greed, on materialism. Folks, that selfishness is destroying us from within. 
And I'm not just going to walk up to a stranger on the street and say, hey, you're selfish and you're part of the problem in America. No. But I can tell the truth that we need to get over ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before the living God. We desperately need His help. And there are a lot of folks out there that respond to that message. Especially when you show them how God is helping you. How God is blessing you. Tell the truth. So number one, there's the call to go. Number two, there's the instructions for the work. And number three, there are some things to remember. In verse 13, he says this, Woe to you, Chorazin. And he goes on, and in these verses, he, he names out some cities that had rejected, that had, that had said no to the gospel, no to the truth, no to the love of God. And they had set their hearts against God. And he tells them how it is. Remember this, there's a, storm, there's a stern warning. If people do not turn to the Lord, there is a judgment day coming. That's right. You heard it. I'm not going to run from that truth. In a culture that now says it is immoral to preach about judgment and the potential of hell, let me tell you what, there is a day when God's patience will end with America and with this world. And they will answer to God. We will answer to God. The world will answer to God for its rejection of His love and His truth. He said, I don't understand that. In some ways, I don't either. But I know this. Our God sent His Son to die on the cross, cross the greatest act of love in the history of the world. Our God has been abundantly patient with us. And there's coming a day that there will be an accounting of all that we've done and how we've responded. Tell the truth with love. Remember, there's a stern warning and there's an important principle. In verse 16, I needed this as I've studied the last two weeks with this passage. I need this so bad. He says, he who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. You know what Jesus is saying? When you preach my truth, and when you give my love, basically remember this, they crucified me for it. That's right. Jesus loved the whole world, and He gave His life. God loved the whole world so much that He sent His own Son to die for the world. And what did they do for Jesus? Do I say they? No. What did we do for Jesus with our sinful natures? We crucified Him. So the Lord says, when you go out and you talk about me and you get rejected for doing that, remember who they're really rejecting. They're rejecting me. Now here's my thing. I want to be careful that I don't say and do things in such a way that I cause somebody to reject God unnecessarily. Amen. I want them to know His great love. And one of the best ways I can do that is by humbly, as humbly as I know how, telling them what the Lord has done for me and how He's changed my life. Remember a stern warning. Remember an important principle. And remember a great reward. Here's what happens when you respond to the call to go and to reap the harvest. First of all, you get to see the power of God. When these guys came back after being out there going to 70, when they got back, this is what they said. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on servants and scorpions and over all uh, the and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Wow! The Lord said, I made you invincible. 
when you're doing what I say to do, you are invincible to do it. (laughs) You get to see the power of God when you go do what God has called you to do. Listen, I promise you, I would have never seen that check for $5,000 if I had not moved. And by the way, that wasn't the only one that came over the next year and a half from that man. But I would have never seen that if I hadn't stepped out in faith and said, okay, God, we're going to go. We're going to do it. And I can't tell you over the years how many times God has done that. And you say, well, pastor, that's what he's done for you. No, wait a minute. Time out. Were you here last Sunday? When you look over the last six months and you see what God has done for us, how he has provided every step of the way, the money, the manpower, the expertise, the things that we needed to to accomplish finishing this tool here, you just go, oh, my goodness, we got to see the power of God. Somebody might say, that's all coincidence. You're good fundraisers. That's a joke. That's the last thing I am or want to be. No, we got to see the power of God. We get to see God move and do mighty things. And when you step out in faith, you say, Pastor, I don't know. And not everybody's called this, but somebody might be called today to be at work in our children's ministry. Scares you to death. I'm not qualified. I don't know if I can do this. But you hear God calling. You say, okay, Lord, you know what you're going to get to see? You're going to get to see the power of God work in your life as He gives you what you need to do the work that He's called you to do. You know, I'm looking for some people that will do something above and beyond what our ushers do every Sunday morning. I'm looking for some people that will be vibrant greeters and make that stranger feel welcome from the moment they walk in the church. You say, preacher, I don't know if I can do that or not. Step out in faith and watch what God does as He uses you like you are. If God calls you to that. If He doesn't do that, please don't volunteer. I've twisted a few people's arms over the years to do things, and man, I've regretted that most of the time. I don't like to do that. No, you do what God calls you to do, okay? But know this, when He does, you get to see the power of God do what you can't do. And that's the problem with American Christianity today. We're all about what we can do. God help us. The Christian life is not boring when we do what God calls us to do and He enables us to do what we're not able to do. And we go, oh my, what a God we serve. How exciting is that? Number three, or number two, you get to appreciate your salvation. I love this verse. He said, nevertheless, he's talking about stepping on serpents and scorpions and doing all this kind of stuff. And he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know, people that respond to the call to the harvest, and they respond to the call to do what God has asked them to do, do you know what they get that is an incredible bonus in their lives? They get to understand their salvation like others do not. He said, you don't rejoice that you can overcome the demons. You rejoice that you're saved. You rejoice that you know the Lord, that that you've been born again, and that you can understand the greatness of what He has done as He saved you. In verse 21, He says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit, and He said, Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. You get to know eternal joy. You know, Moose made the statement up here this morning as he's talking about being a life group leader. He said, Pastor John told me, Moose, you hang in there, you keep going, because you're going to learn more than they do. 
And you're going to be blessed by that. Moose, did it happen? Absolutely, didn't it? And did you get joy that you'd never discovered before, brother? He sure did. You know why? Because he was being obedient to the Father and what God had called him to do. And he had eternal joy because he did that. Now, folks, here's the best reward I can tell you about, and I'm going to have a closing illustration. Verse 22, Jesus said this, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Then He turns His disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. You mean you sum that up for you in just a quick word? You get to know the Father. You get to know God. Now, there may be some of you here today that say, Pastor, I know what you're saying is the truth, but it's been a long time since I've really seen God work in my life. I hope this sermon makes you hungry. So I'm not just preaching to people that have trusted Christ as their Savior and and never really gotten engaged in, in the work of God. But I am preaching to those people too. You don't know what you're missing. You don't know what's happening in your life. You don't know the joy of knowing the Father in heaven and to know the blessing of being exactly where He wants you to be. Let me tell you what, folks. It's the coolest thing in my life. It's the greatest joy in my life. And it's an eternal joy because I know that what I'm doing is going to count for eternity. You get to know the Father. You get to know His nuances. You get to know His love for you. You get to know His truth. You just get to understand things about Him that you'll never get anywhere other place. How do you get there? You say, Lord, here I am. I want what you have got for me. I want to serve you. I want to know you. I want to love you. And Lord, I want my life to count For eternity. Do you want your life at the end of it to say all that it really was was a bank account? Or land? Or stuff? Do you want them to bury you in your Cadillac? No. Your Porsche. Yeah, that's better. Cadillac doesn't hardly work anymore, does it? Do you want them? is, Is that what your goal is? I tell you what, that is the lie that's being spread in our world today. It's been spread for years. This is the American dream. That I I live, I work, I retire at 55, and I play for the rest of my life. You realize what your life looks like on the scope of eternity? It is smaller than the atom. And you're saying, this is what life is all about? Are you kidding me? I want my life to mount for eternity. Whatever that is. I want my fire to burn bright while I'm here on this earth for the Lord Jesus Christ so that I can share eternity with those that He lets me invite to go with me. Now hear me, I am not telling you today that you have got to be a person that goes and knocks on doors, that pigeonholes everybody you meet and tell, you tell them about Jesus. But I am saying to you that you need to be a person that says, God, I will respond to the call that you have for my life. I just want to be obedient to you. Now, I don't know where that's going to take you. Are you going to tell people about Jesus? Sure you are. Just maybe not the way I just described Are you going to to share truth about the Lord with people? Sure you are. But you're going to do it with the unique gifting that God has given you. I'll try and help you learn how. But you're going to do it with your gifts and with your means. It might be why you're working up uh, trying to build some of the stuff in the children's museum that we want to build 
so our kids can come and we can have that place to hang out with them. It might be while you're weeding the flowers out in front of the church. It might be while you're going down Main Street in Kiowa and you're, you're walking in a business and you're, you're telling a business person, you know what, I just want to bless you. Can I clean your toilet today? I'm serious. I'm serious. We're going to do that one day in the near future in Kiowa. We're just going to go and find ways that we can serve this community. You know why? Because we want them to know that we care about them, we love them, and that we've got something that's bigger than us. And His name is Jesus. So, what's the calling? I don't know what your calling is, except I know what the mission is. And the mission is for us to know Him and to make Him known. Whatever opportunities the Lord gives us. Folks, it's, har- it's harvest time. The pea patch is ready to be picked. I've been asking God for laborers. And you know what God's been doing? He's been supernaturally providing laborers. We have some needs in this church right now. I'm talking about in the ministry that we're doing. We need children's teachers. Not a job for everybody, but it's a job for somebody. It's being called. We have a need to finish some things. I mean, we're in our building, the remodel's done. No, it's not. There's still some things that need to be finished. We need folks that are good with their hands. But there's more need than that. There's the need that says, hey, I want to find my place to serve. Well, let's sit down and talk about what your gifts are. Let's sit down and talk about what your burden is. Let's sit down and talk about the area that you see that's on your heart that's needing to be filled. And let's figure out how God can use you to do that. Whatever it is, it all starts with this thing right here. Lord, I surrender. And I want you to use me. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's where it starts with you too. I need something that's bigger than me. I need someone that's bigger than me. I need forgiveness of my sin. I need a change in my life. I need hope. I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me tell you what, friend. You need Jesus. And I invite you to come to Him for His salvation. For the rest of us, whether it's here or in another church, if you're just visiting today, The Lord of the harvest said, pray. I've prayed. I believe God is calling. I'm inviting you to come to the pea patch and help me harvest the abundant crop that's there. Now we're going to, in just a moment, have a time of commitment. No, a time of surrender. (laughs) Surrender is different from commitment. Commitment says, okay, I'll get involved. Surrender says, Lord, whatever you want, here I go. I didn't really find joy in my heart until I surrendered, okay? During this time of surrender today, there may be somebody that that says, I don't really know how to be saved. Would you help me? Pastor Brian will be here. I'll be here. And we'll be glad to, to share with you the gospel of how to know Christ. There may be others that say, you know what? I just, as as Cecil said when he was 18 years old, he rededicated his life. That's a term that we used to use in church a lot. What that really means is I surrendered my life and said, Lord, here I am, use me. Well, if God's calling you today to this, I want to challenge you to do something public. I'm going to challenge you to take a piece of your bulletin and write your first name on it. I don't need to know your whole name. I don't need to know you. I'm just wanting you to do this for you and for God. But I'm challenging you during this time when we're going to have music playing softly, you write your name on it and you come up, put it in the basket. If you want to stay and pray, you can. Just move over to the side because somebody else may want to come put something in. But you just put your name in the basket and by so doing, saying, Lord, I want to be a part of the harvest. I want my life to count for eternity's sake. And so today, I surrender. Whatever you want. Now, I know that terrifies you. 
It's terrified me many, many times. But it's the path to the greatest joy for your life. The path of obedience to God. So as God speaks, you let Him have His way. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on and be in place. Right now, Miss Deborah's just going to play softly. as We have this time. God speaking. You respond.
Lord Jesus, you said to ask, and Lord, we've asked. You said you'd call, and Lord, you've called. I hold in my hands a basket that has names in it. Just pieces of paper. No, Lord, your people. You're saying, we're saying together, we surrender. Lord, none of us knows all that means. But I pray that this would be a beginning today for some, a renewal for others. But a monumental day where we be, we see things where we get to know you like we've never known you before. God, I pray for an explosion in this community of people coming to Jesus because of the love they feel from this church, from this place. God, we cry out to You for a lost world. But I cry out to You in praise today for an army that's being assembled to go harvest. And Lord, I want to say to folks that are doing this for the first time, welcome to the pea patch. It's a wonderful place to serve. To know you. Thank you, Lord. We give this up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing, brother. It's easy to surrender to the Lord and then already, Lord, what would you do? And fear could kick in. Doubt could kick in. I want to close this service with this wonderful song, Whom Shall I Fear? We have nothing to fear. Christ said before He left, I am with you always. If you could just ponder that. You have the God of the universe with you, alongside of you, always. When you sleep. He is still there. We have nothing to fear. Whom shall I fear? Let's close and stand and sing this from our hearts. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. No darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Who shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, no troubles linger still. Who shall I fear? I know who goes before. Me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side For you you will deliver me Yours is the victory Who shall I fear? Who shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side who reigns forever He is a friend of mine A God of angel armies He's always by my 
As we get ready to go, I, I want all of our elder leadership committee guys to come up here real quick. Just, just you can, okay. See, Chris is holding Rye there, so we don't, he could bring him, but that's okay. All right. Leadership committee guys is who I'm looking for here. All right. These are your elders right here. Come on up here, Chris. I want you to see them. Pastor Paul, step over here with us. There's some of you today that have taken a big step and you said, I surrender. Well, I want you to know, trying to make sure that everybody's trained and finding their place is a big job, okay? You can talk to these guys right here. We want to help you. We want to equip you. We want to find a place. That's primarily my job and Pastor Paul's job. But if you need to talk to somebody about it and help us get things going, these are guys that you can come talk to, okay? They've been praying for you all weekend. They've been seeking God for vision. They've been praying for each other. They've been praying for me. It's been cool. And we're looking forward to what God's going to do as we go forward. Right after services today, we're going to meet with our the leaders of our different ministries. We're going to be casting a vision that God gave us over the last few days. And then that's going to be coming to you in the weeks to come as... Uh, we try to, to get this army mobilized to do the work that God has for us to do. It's a big task. Please be patient with us, okay? It, it's a daunting task for me because we want you to feel like you belong and you're a part of what God is doing in his kingdom. So help us help you, okay? And let us know. And know these men that stand here beside me and their wives are praying for you and for this ministry, and for what God has for you. Thank you. God bless you. Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing today. And I pray now, Lord, as we leave here, that we would go in your love and your power. And, Lord, as we've surrendered to you, we are listening to you. What's next? Lord, lay on the hearts of every one of us the things that the next steps that you want us to take. And, Lord, as we get in your word, we pray, we seek, we know that you'll bless that. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to sing a song as we leave, as usual. And as we do that, I want to remind our ministry leaders, we're going to meet out in a double-wide trailer. There's a bunch of kids in there right now, so it's going to take a few minutes for the transition. But uh, we'll be meeting out there probably in about 10, 15 minutes, okay? So don't get hung up too long here talking to all the new folks in our church until you head out there, all right? Okay, what are we going to sing, Paul? Do what? That was our last song? Praise the Lord. We're dismissed. <laughs>